So today we're going to talk about instrumental concepts that weren't covered in instrumental. Okay, so this is where we, we build on what you've already had in the chemistry curriculum. And we add in some discussion on microscopy, ion mobility, spectrometry, and we go a little bit deeper into IR, attenuated total reflectance, because it's such a useful technique. And so we'll, uh, we'll hit several different instrumental techniques that, um, that are useful in forensic science. And so we use uh, microscopes and spectroscopy. You've had a lot of spectroscopy through PCHEM. And, and yet we haven't really talked much about microscopy. And then we also have uh, microspectroscopy. So you're doing spectroscopy through the microscope. And that's pretty cool. We have that in my lab, the infrared microscope. So you can do infrared spectroscopy. You can do UV vis naturally, fluorescence spectroscopy, all through the microscope. And so then you just put micro in front of that technique. So micro FTIR is FTIR through a microscope. Um, here's the electromagnetic spectrum, just to, just to refresh your memory. Uh, most of our work is done in the mid-infrared and in the visible. And then we use x-rays for like scanning electron microscopy. We'll blast the sample with uh, electrons and we'll see x-rays come out. As electrons are knocked out of the 1s orbital typically, then other electrons jump into that chair that's vacant and spit out an x-ray. But let's talk about microscopy. It really is a, a clever use of refraction of light. So lenses are based upon refraction of light. And so this is a good chance to review some of the terminology related to re light refraction or bending when it hits an interface. It doesn't have to be glass. It bends it at water. Okay, and, and any kind of abrupt change in refractive index is something that can reflect light or bend it. So let's go through some of the terms here that are important. So here we have light coming in at an incident angle. And it's hitting the surface of glass. And some of the vocabulary words I'd like for you to internalize and remember is this this line coming out here is normal to the surface. Oh, come back. My pen's acting up. It's showing the mouse and not giving me the drawing tool. Huh, I don't know why that's happening. Not sure why I can't use the pen. Okay, well, we'll just use the laser pointer, but that will make the video not as nice because we won't be able to see where the pen is. But this, this line right here is the normal to the surface. What that means is it's 90 degrees to the surface. And reflection preserves that angle. So we calculate the incident angle not with respect to the surface, but with respect to the normal. Because when light bounces off, that <coughs> angle with respect to the normal is conserved. So it comes in at a certain angle to the normal, and then it comes back at a certain angle to the normal. The other reason it's nice is that <clears throat> that normal can project into the surface. And so then this angle here of incident light in air um, is related to this angle inside with respect to glass. Look, if it wasn't bent at all, it would follow this dotted line. But because it hits glass, which has a higher refractive index, it bends inward and it has this angle. And so that, that's Snell's law. This angle inside the glass compared to this angle inside the air is related with the sine function and then the refractive indices of air and glass. So when it goes into a, 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 a um, goes into a medium with a higher refractive index, it kind of gets dragged in at a at a uh, at a shallower angle. And then when it comes out, notice this is a small angle hitting the normal. It comes out with a larger angle with respect to the normal. So it bends to the right twice. <laughs> and that's how our lenses work. And so if this is the, like the 
corner of a lens, you see now the light is pointing towards the middle. If we go to the other side of the lens where the angles are the opposite, then this, this beam of light would be pointing towards the middle. And so if you take a, a, a convex lens, then it will focus light to a point. Now, what is refractive index? This is how you would calculate it. If you could measure the speed of light, the fastest that the light can go, it's defined as the speed of light in a vacuum. So it's not interacting with any medium at all. So light in a vacuum travels 299792458 meters per second. So it's about 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And I know that number by heart because that was a cheat code on one of my little building games when I played with Thomas. <laughs> it was a Lego crystalline complex. It was great. So uh, we, had to, we had that memorized. So we type it in immediately so we could build fast. So that was the speed of light in the vacuum. And then in the material, it's slower. Okay. So why would it be slower in a material? Yeah, it's interacting with something. And most of the time when light, you know, visible light especially, is interacting with the, the electron cloud. Now, it's not absorbing because that would be absorbance. It's just passing through. But when it passes through, you have an oscillating electric field, and the electron cloud is a negative, you know, cloud. And so it's oscillating with light and dragging it. Uh, you could think of it as many, many virtual absorptions and emissions. Okay, they're not hitting an actual state, so they're not totally absorbed, but they're interacting. So they slow the light down. So the refractive index, uh, the fastest speed is on top, the, sl the slower speed is on bottom. So they're going to be greater than one. So refractive index for vacuum, would be vacuum compared to vacuum, it would be one. But a vacuum compared to air is 1.0003. <laughs> it's only, you know, three thousandths faster in vacuum than it is in air. So air does not slow down light very much at all. But glass could be 1.3, so like 30% slower. So it really slows down in glass. You could also measure the, the wavelength of, in the vacuum and the wavelength in the material. Because if it slows down, the wavelength gets longer. The thing that's conserved is the frequency. So the frequency is conserved, but the wavelength and the speed change. So remember we said, what's new? C over lambda, so C changes and lambda changes, both, but the frequency doesn't change. And so then you can say, you know, safely understand these things, the you know, refractive index of glass is greater than air, and so then the angle for air is less than the glass. So using that concept, we can build our microscopes, and so they get quite complex. Now, since you want light to go from point A to B, uh, a lot of these optics in the middle are just transferring the image through the tubes and so on. So there's not a lot going on with these interior optics. Sometimes they go through pinholes and things to clean up the, uh, the resolution, but the main point down here is the objective, because you have the object plane, and the objective takes that object image and moves it into the, the tube of the microscope, and then back here you have the uh, loop or eye lens or eyepiece. And the total magnification is the product of all the different magnifications. So if you have an objective that's a 40x objective and an eyepiece that's a 10x objective, then the total magnification is 400x. The thing about magnification nowadays, though, is it's a little, um, I don't know what I want to say, uh, ambiguous because we're not, no longer using our eye as the standard detector. I mean, in a, if you're looking through the microscope, yes, you're using your eye as the standard detector, but we put cameras on these so often that now the camera is the standard detector. And then we take that camera image, which, you know, it might be 400x, but then we show it on a projector, and now it's, you know, 96 inches across. So what's the magnification? And so you can calculate the ocular magnification, which might be 400x, but then if you take that same image that would have been put on your eye, and its perceived size, and then blow that up, um, it's even larger. Um, but that doesn't mean your spectral resolution has gotten better, okay? You may still have a fuzzy image, it just may be 96 inches across. <laughs> okay, so we need to think about resolving power, not just magnification. And so the resolving power of a microscope is really how, how close can two objects be that are not touching, and you still see light between them? 
So think about that. Two objects are very close. Take two fibers. How close can those two fibers be and you still see light between them? If they get too close, you'll think they're one object. Because if you don't see light between the two objects, you think it's one object. So that's the re what we mean by resolution. It's very similar to spectral resolution, where you have two peaks close together. And if those two peaks get too close together, they make one peak. And so how far apart do two peaks have to be before you can say they're resolved? And so a lot of times we call it a 50% resolution. So the two peaks are far enough apart that the dip in between them goes down 50%. Or you could have baseline resolution, where the peaks are far enough apart that the dip between them goes down to the baseline. You see the difference? So in spectral resolution, we talk about 50% resolved or baseline resolved. And in microscopy, we talk about the amount of light that gets through between the two objects. And you could have it be totally black or occluded or back to the, the brightness of the source. And so if it gets all the way back to the brightness of the source, that would be what we call baseline resolved. The light coming through is all the way as, as bright as, as the source. If it's about half as bright as the source, then that would be 50% resolved. And so we, there's a couple of, figure, uh, couple of items that, that relate to this, um, this resolving power. And one is the numerical aperture. And it has to do with, uh, it, with the um, refractive index of this gap here and the angle aperture of the lens. So you know about lenses, right? They can have a, a really short focal length or a really long focal length. And the higher magnification lenses have very short focal lengths. So think about this. If this is the focal point for that lens and it's very close to the lens, so this is a very short distance, then that angle of acceptance is large. So that would be a high angle of aperture. So high magnification will have a big angle and a short focal length. And so that would be a, a large numerical aperture. Okay. I mean, an angle of aperture. And so then, uh, you know, the sine of that angle, it goes, <laughs> sine of zero, okay, is zero, but then it goes up, what's the maximum? What, what angle would sine be a maximum? 90. 90, okay, and so it passes 90, that's its maximum, and then it goes to 180, and it's back down to zero, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so uh, this is that angle over 2. Okay, so now that function has a maximum at 180, because 180 over 2 is going to be 90. All right? And so <laughs> the, the, the biggest this angle could be would be 180, right? The lens is focal point is right on the surface of the lens <laughs> and it's accepting a light from 180 degrees and that's you're never going to reach that okay but but the, the the point is the sharper the focus the shorter the focal length the bigger this numerical aperture all right and that bigger that sine function is going to be and that's going to give you the large numerical aperture the resolving power is inversely proportional to that numerical aperture so you start to lose the ability to resolve things when you're over magnifying. You're using a really strong magnifying lens. Then you, you start losing the ability to resolve things. Uh, this resolving power, this, this function 0.6 times the wavelength that you're using to resolve the items divided by the numerical aperture. And so let's go on. When we're using, say, this... Uh, um, here's the two lines. These two objects are close together, but you can still see light between them. And so let's say we're using light that's right in the middle of the visible region, 550 nanometers. And we have an oil immersion lens, so that numerical aperture is, uh, is 1.3. Then we would be able to uh, resolve items that are 2 point, or 254 nanometers apart. So that would be the resolving power. Now, if we use the same lens in air, the resolving power is 1 over the refractive index. And so 
the resolving power in air would be the resolving power in oil, which is given up here, 254 nanometers, and then the ratio of the refractive indices of oil versus air. And so we have uh, this immersion oil, this um, glycerin oil, we have all these different kinds of uh, refractive indices for these different kinds of oils. And so we could put in there, say, 1.5, it looks like a lot of them are 1.5, so we put in 1.5 for the refractive index of oil, 1.0003 for air, and you see that now our resolving power went from 254 nanometers to 385. So this might be the image that we would see if we were using air between our objective and the surface versus when we're using oil. And so some of these lenses, if you'll see, the objectives say oil on them. And so you actually have to put a drop of oil and stick the lens in the oil because light's coming from the sample through that oil into the lens and that gives you better resolving power because of the higher refractive index. Now these uh, refractive indices, you'd say, wow, how do we know all the refractive indices for these different oils? They actually make kits that have a series of these oils. And so let me show you on the board what we're talking about in terms of uh, using these different oils. Let's say you have a piece of glass and it has uh, a refractive index of 1.4. So see the paraffin oil? So we have a, a glass chip. And we put it in air, okay, so air. And we see the edges. And we see this glass chip. Let's say we want to find out what this is. So we want to know what that refractive index is. We can go to our oil kit and put in a drop of oil around this. And let's say we pick, uh, we start heavy, you know, so we go in and we get uh, some synthetic oil uh, or cedar wood. N equals 1.5. These, these lines kind of fade a little bit, but we can still see them. And the reason we can see them is because light's hitting that, it's going through the oil, which has a refractive index of 1.5, and it hits the edge of that glass, which has a refractive index of 1.4, and there's a change in refractive index. It's not much, but there's a change. So light bounces off of that interface. So why does light reflect or bounce or refract? It's because of the change in the refractive index. And so then we change that oil out, wash it off, and then we put in um, say something like glycerin and now the edges really disappear in fact a lot of times we'll start to see defects inside but we'll totally lose the outside edge and we say wow now since we look at glycerin it's 1.48 or seven, we're getting really close to the refractive index of, of light, uh, of the glass. And then we go to the next fluid, and we put in water, and the edges come back. And water was 1.3. So we know that between 1.3 and 1.5 was a place where the edges disappeared. And when the edges disappear, then you've matched the refractive index. Because light's coming at an object and there's no change in refractive index, so the light doesn't bounce off that interface. It doesn't know that it's in a different medium. So it's in oil, 1.4. It goes into the glass, 1.4. It never noticed a difference when it went from one to the other. So because it didn't notice, it didn't bend, it didn't bounce off, it didn't reflect. So we don't see any dark edges in the image because we didn't have a change in refractive index. Now it gets inside and maybe these are little air pockets and we start to see those kinds of things that we couldn't see before. So that's why we have these kits with all different kinds of refractive indices so that you can go in and you can test. And it's, it's non-destructive because you can still wash this glass chip off and get the oils off.
Now, if your product dissolves in the oils, that's a problem. Okay, so, you know, you're trying to do this on an organic substance and maybe, maybe it's soluble in some of these oils. So that's, that's, a, that's a real issue. But a lot of times for glass, then that's great. Now, if you want to know more about microscopy, this is a great resource. It's Olympus micro, uh, Olympus microscopes. You click this link. And if you end up in uh, forensic science, this would be a great place to get tutorials on everything related to microscopy. So you can come down here, you've got basic concepts in optical microscopy, specialized techniques, digital imaging, which includes image manipulation and image enhancement. Um, also then uh, fluorescence micro, micro, micrography. And then it's got these great uh, digital image galleries. And so we will look at some of these later when we get to physical properties of evidence. But it's just got some amazing, you know, plant tissue and polarized light micrographs. So these are some of the different crystals and some of the images that you get when you use cross-polarization. So we talked about polarized light all the time in physical chemistry. Now we'll actually use it in microscopy. So let's look at examples of when we might use polarized light. So the, what's the purpose? Let me just check the video real quick. Okay. What is the, the purpose of microscopy? Like in this case, why did we do those refractive uh, uh, index oils? We were trying to find the refractive index of the substance. But notice how different oils provided different outlines. The, being able to detect the outline of an object, you need contrast. Okay. So whenever you're even in, in PowerPoint or Word, when you're adjusting the image, Adjusting the contrast, what does that do? It sort of makes, you know, foreground and background starkly different. And so that's what you're wanting to do in most cases is to enhance the contrast. And polarized light is one of the best tools for enhancing contrast. So here to the left is an example where we have cross polarizers. If you notice here, we've got unpolarized light coming out of our source. Okay. And that's going through this polarizer and it's selecting. See this vector here? It's selecting light that's polarized left and right from your view. Then it goes through a specimen. This is an isotropic specimen, which means it does not change the direction of polarized light. It comes into the analyzer and the analyzer is selecting only light that's polarized into and out of the board. And so it totally blocks all of that light. And so we don't see that glass chip at all, which is great if on that glass chip we had some organic substance that rotated light. We wouldn't see anything related to the glass. We would only see the things that rotate the polarization of light. Let's, um, let's skip past the middle one and go over here to the right one. This anisotropic, anisotropic specimen, the polarizers are still arranged the way that they were before. We have uh, left and right polarization here, and in and out polarization up here on our analyzer. And now we have a substance that has a directional dependence on refractive index. And chiral compounds do this. So chiral compounds will rotate light. They have a directional dependence in their refractive index. Other uh, substances, crystalline substances, will have a large refractive index in one direction and a small refractive index in a different direction. And so you can rotate them uh, in this cross polarized and certain colors of light will make it through. But notice from the left where we don't have any contrast at all, the foreground or the object and the background look the same. Look on the right. We have an enormous amount of contrast. The foreground or the object that we're looking for is white and the background is totally black. So when you have cross polarizers, you can't see the source because the light's coming through and being totally blocked. So the background is totally black. You don't see any light. 
and your substance, if it's in between those, if it rotates light at all, will then show up with enhanced contrast. So this is a great way, we just put two polarizers in, one on your source, one on your, on your viewing, and you can rotate them or you can rotate your sample, and you can enhance the contrast that way. Super easy. And these are some of the images that I've taken in my lab. These are crystals that were precipitated out of water, uh, starting with different solvents. So we had nitroaniline dissolved in, say, methanol, and then we took a mill of that and put it into 10 mils of uh, water and it crashed out of these crystals. Uh, it crashed these crystals out. And you can see the different colors. <coughs> now what's happening with the different colors is the thickness of the crystal is rotating that light and when it exits, it's going through and let's say the green photons have a particular uh, polarization that they can get through my, my detector polarizer but the red and the yellow and the blue are at different angles, and so they get blocked. And so the green makes it through. Well, what if the crystal is a little thicker in some other place, and now it rotates around to the red has got the correct polarization. So the red is detected, and the green and the blue and the yellow are in different angles. So you will see a lot of colored uh, crystals come out through this cross-polarization method, and the color is kind of related to the thicknesses or the directions of the crystals. And so we can see up here, this is kind of an interesting one. There was solvent stuck in this crystal. And so then when the solvent evaporated, it left a little pit in the middle. And so you can see the difference in depth in this crystal. You've got a green pit and a pink outer border. And this crystal too has a chip taken out of it. So the chip area is pink and the rest of the crystal is green. And the background's totally black because of the cross polarizer. If looking at this with just straight light without the polarizers is pretty boring. It just looks like crystals, you know. And uh, you, you put the cross polarizers on and you can really see an enhancement of the image. And you can, with the enhanced contrast now, you can, enhance, you can do a better job of focusing. It's very hard to focus on something that's not well defined. And so if you're trying to get a good crisp image, this is another way. You enhance the, enhance the contrast and then you can improve the focus. Let's go back and review some spectroscopic terms and get familiar with these equations. I've got a couple of homework problems, like what, what is the absorbance of a, of a uh, solution that absorbs at 50% transmittance, and then what is the transmittance of a substance that has a 0.5 absorbance. So I want you to get comfortable with swapping back and forth between absorbance and transmittance. And percent transmittance is just transmittance times 100%. Transmittance is a fractional value, it's less than one. Okay. I mean, depending on what you're dividing by, you could have uh, a problem with your background and have a transmittance that's greater than one, but that's not, not ideal, it's not what you want. And then we have uh, down here different types of absorbance and reflection. So if the, if, the material go, if the light goes into the material, it can be absorbed. If it comes out the other side, it's transmitted. Uh, it can interact with the material and be emitted like with fluorescence. It can scatter off like with Raman scattering or just bouncing off of it, reflection. And there's different types of reflectance. So let's look at these two pieces here. This is specular reflectance. And I've drawn the normal to the surface here in red. So that angle is preserved with respect to the normal. And that's called specular reflectance. Another way to tell if, you're, if you have specular reflectance and you're trying to detect with your eye, when you look at the surface, with specular reflectance, you see the source in the surface. So when I'm standing here and walking around this table, it's bright right there because I'm seeing that light in the table. And so th that angle right there is specular reflectance from that light. All other angles are diffuse reflectance from that light. So specular reflectance is very particular. It's the angle between the source and the detector with respect to the normal of that surface. And all other angles are diffuse reflectance. The reason this is important is if you want the color of the substance, you want to use re diffuse reflectance. So write that one down. If you want to know the color of a surface, 
you need to use diffuse reflectance. If you want to know the color of a substance, you need to use diffuse reflectance. And you can see this in everyday objects. I'm looking at the top of this mouse. And if I see the source, if I'm looking at the light reflecting off the top of the mouse, the mouse looks white there because the source is white. So with specular reflectance, I'm looking at the source's color. But at other angles, I see the true color of the object. It's blue. Same with this mug. This is really shiny. And so I can definitely see that projector uh, right uh, you know, right there. I, I'm looking at the projector, and it looks white. But this mug is not white. This mug is, mug is maroon. Okay. And so if I want to get the color of the, the mug, I don't want to look at the specular angle. I want to look at the diffuse angle. I want to look at some other angle. Now, what is specular used for? Well, it's very bright when you have a, a smooth surface. And so if I were to look at the brightness of the room light coming off this surface, it would be very bright. And then if I look at the brightness of that room light coming off of this surface, it would be dimmer because this surface is rougher. And so specular reflectance can be used to, to characterize the roughness of a surface. Specular reflectance can tell you the roughness of a surface. We did a little bit of that with the color lab. Didn't y'all do solid samples this yeah. year? Yeah, so you saw, um, saw some re reflectance. You were thinking about reflectance at least. Um, they make attachments for the spectrometers that measure diffuse reflectance and specular reflectance, and you can take the difference between the two and so on. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of instruments. I know y'all hit this pretty well in instrumental block diagrams and such. Uh, but let's talk first about dispersive instruments. So you have uh, some source and sample, uh, and then it enters the monochrometer and the detector. So what we've got shown here is really just the monochrometer piece and the detector piece. And so up here we have a diode array instrument where the grating is fixed and the light is dispersed onto this, this array. These have really come down in price because of digital photography. So the real market for, for detectors in the visible range is, is cameras. Okay. And so then we just take those high resolution cameras and put them into a spectrometer. So they're dirt cheap. Now they make visible spectrometers, just like this one on the left, that plug into the USB drive on a computer. And they're that big. So they're just, it's just a spectrometer on a chip. It's not very high resolution, but it's, it's still very, very inexpensive and you can measure uh, color values and so on very easily. So that's a, that's a fixed grading or, or a prism system and it's dispersing light onto a diode array. And higher resolution just requires more pixels. Well, as we get to higher and higher pixel count on our camera and sensor elements, this is becoming very cheap. The only thing is that sometimes it's wasteful because the camera element comes with a 2D array and we really just need a one-dimensional array. We just need light to be uh, cast onto this diode array. We just need a stripe. We don't need a full image. And the problem with dispersive instruments is right here. Higher resolution requires narrow slits and more pixels. And so the narrow slits, what that does is it reduces your signal. And so because you're reducing your signal, your signal to noise ratio goes high. So you just don't have a lot of light coming in. And you're turning the detector up as high as it'll go in terms of being sensitive. And it's looking as carefully as it can, and it sees a lot of noise. And so high resolution for dispersive instruments is very noisy. And so then you've got to just wait and average for a long period of time. Now scanning instruments, you've got a fixed detector 
and you scan the grating or the prism and you send the different wavelengths through the detector one at a time and higher resolution requires narrow slits still so that lowers the amount of light you have and then slow scan speeds so high resolution is slow for scanning but it's also slow for a diode array because you've got to average for a long period of time and see how many photons you have at each pixel and trying to get a good signal to noise means you have a slow system, a slow scan system. Let's look uh, at some of the spectral terms. And I put this in here just because we use Gaussian line shapes a lot in PCM. And we used plus or minus sigma for our line width, and that wasn't exactly correct. Okay, so I wanted to be specific here and talk about the spectral term of full width at half maximum. And a Gaussian peak shape, that sigma, the standard deviation for that normal distribution, is not the full width at half maximum. It's the inflection point. So somewhere, say down here, let's see, yes, yeah, it's, um, it's probably up here a little bit, is an inflection point. Oh, I forgot my pen can't work. Uh, there's an inflection point up here that is sigma. So sigma is smaller than the full width at half maximum. The full width at half maximum is exactly what it says. It's the full width of the peak halfway down the peak. And so I've done the algebra for you and, and converted that sigma and Gaussian over to the full width at half maximum and this is the formula for it. So if you have a standard deviation now you can calculate what the full width of half maximum would be for that Gaussian distribution. Just it's a nice to have that as a spectral term. Now our resolving power of a spectrometer is the wavelength that we're interested in divided by that full width at half maximum. So how close can two peaks be? Well it's that wavelength that you're detecting divided by the delta L lambda, so or the full width at half maximum. And that would be our resolving power. Now, there's other things that we do to spectrometers that makes them a, a little more complicated, and one of them is to get rid of, of drift. How many people uh, use the SPEC-20s in lab? Describe using the SPEC-20s. What was, what was the pain about it? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> okay, good. Let's di di drill down a little further. <laughs> Blanking at every single measurement. Why did you have to do that? Drifts, and so you see up here ways to correct for sample drift. Now you've talked about double beam instruments, and so a true double beam instrument has two sample and uh, so sample and reference chamber, and and two detectors. So there's really two beams that are being detected at the same time. But you could do the same thing with what we call temporal double beam. So you send may send light through both samples, but you just detect one channel at a time. And so this is called a chopper, this rotating mirror that has segments in it between clear and silver. And so it's spinning and it's sending sample and reference, sample and reference over to the detector. So a lot of times the software converts that for us into a, into a uh, spectrum. But this is, what, this is what the detector actually sees down here. So the signal is going along and then there's a sharp jump when the mirror surface of the, uh, of the chopper comes in and then it goes away to glass and then mirror, glass, mirror, glass, mirror. So you're seeing reference sample, reference sample, reference sample. And it's jumping up and down in time. And then you just have a circuit that's in time with that and it takes the, the ratio of I over I naught and calculates transmittance. Now the book had this as a chart recorder and that's why I'm laughing out loud because how many of y'all have seen the chart recorder even? They, they don't exist. I mean, they might be on some ancient instruments, but uh, most of the things are computerized now, so I don't know why they said chart recorder. But this is what you would see if you were standing at the detector, and then you can run a simple uh, program that takes the ratio of I over I naught and produce this spectrum. But look at the baseline. Follow the mouse here. The baseline's here, 
and it's creeping up. So I'm just following the baseline, I naught, and it drifts back down, and then it's drifting up, it's drifting up. That would be a total pain with the Spec 20. And so the computer is doing, and, the, and this instrument's doing what you were doing by hand. You were taking I and I naught by putting in blank and, and sample, and this is doing it a lot faster. It's important because if you look at this, here's the baseline signal, and it's as big as this peak. And that peak would be totally measured as baseline if this was the last time you took a baseline measurement. You would totally miss that peak. And I kind of looked at this spectrum and tried to match. You know, you got this double peak here. That's this three measurements here or five measurements here. That's kind of the double peak. You got this, oh boy. You've got this big peak here. That's this one here. Okay, so, so this spectrum, even though it's very drifty and it's got a crummy baseline, comes out nicely after doing this, this what we call chopping. Another term for this is called modulation. So we're modulating at a particular frequency. And the modulation frequency is going to be the frequency at which you're susceptible to noise. This will cancel out noise that's off frequency, but it won't cancel noise that's on frequency. Think about that. If, if, this, if this chopper is spinning around and it's changing the signal at, say, 60.1 hertz, that would be a disaster. So your spectrum would seem totally broken if you were chopping this signal at near 60 hertz. Why? Does that number ring a bell to anybody? What's going on in 60 hertz in this country? So you're modulating, you're going I, I not, I, I not, and you're doing that every time at, at 60 times a second. And if you were to do that at 60 times a second, you would get trash for data. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, electrical supplies run at 60 hertz. So these plugs run at 60 hertz. And so the power signal is going up and down at 60 hertz. So the, the source is going to even have a flicker at 60 hertz. And so are the detector. It's, it's going to have some line flicker to its power. There's going to be a ripple in your instrument at 60 times a second. And if your chopper is running at 60 times a second, if it gets in phase or out of phase, it's going to be zero signal to maximum signal. And it's going to be crazy noisy. So your spectrometer is drifting and bouncing at 60 hertz. If you are off of that, then you won't see it. So you're doing I over I naught at, at some other frequency, not 60 hertz, not 30 hertz, not 120 hertz, not 180, not 240. What am I doing? Right. So overtones of 60 hertz. You want to stay away from all of those frequencies that have anything to do with 60. And and so that's something that might catch you if you've got a, you know, a chopper or some kind of instrument that's doing modulation. But most companies know this. They build it in, into the instruments. Now, that's different in Europe. What do you think it is in Europe? Or do you know? It's 50 hertz. <laughs> so they would have wanted to avoid 50, 100, 200, all of those different multiples of 50. Whereas we would want to mul avoid all multiples of 60. So you got to have an instrument that's built for your region or one that's compatible with multiple regions. But you may buy something in, in Europe, install it in the United States, and it acts totally crazy. Maybe they've made a mistake and put it at, say, 180 hertz, because that's nice and distant from 50 and 200 and 100, but it nails our, our line voltage. So. Okay, let's talk now about getting away from dispersive instruments and into instruments that use interferometry, like the Fourier transform infrared spectrometer. The Fourier transform is how you get this from this interferogram over to the spectrum. We covered that in fair detail in PKM. But here, the main point is there are no slits in this instrument. There's an aperture, but it's not as narrow as a slit. It just cleans up the source a little bit. <clears throat> 
And so 100% of the light is being used. So we have huge signal, and that leads to a good signal-to-noise ratio. And then high resolution is pretty quick. All we have to do is move the mirror. And so we move this mirror and in the interferometer, and if we move it twice as far, you have twice the resolution. And so then we have this attachment that has really helped. We used to have to make, for solid samples, uh, potassium bromide pellets. And so you mix your sample in with potassium bromide, and you grind it in a mortar and pestle, and then put it in a little pellet press, and press it up and make a little window with your sample inside. There's several problems with this. One, potassium bromide soaks up water like crazy. It's a salt. Okay? And you don't want a big spectrum of water. So you've got to do this in a pretty dry environment. So that's a pain. Uh, two, uh, getting too much sample, your peaks are going to absorb all the way up to infinity. You know, they're going to block all the light. Not enough sample, you won't see the weak peaks. So you have to put just the right amount of sample in. You have to grind it in a dry environment. You have to make a clear window with KBR. If it doesn't work, you've got to start over. And so you got to do this over and over again until you get just the right amount of sample and a dry amount of KBR, very clear window, get a good spectrum, you're done. But that could take, you know, three, maybe four tries. Whereas the attenuated total reflectance, you put a little bit of your sample powder on there, press down this, this little tower press to push it against the diamond, and hit go. And you're going to get a good spectrum every time. Okay, no sample prep. It's also non-destructive. You can wipe that sample off and put it back. So how does it work? Well, the light comes from the interferometer, bounces off the inside of the diamond. So this shape here is a diamond. It, they can make them out of germanium and other substances, but diamond is the most robust because it's so hard. Uh, your sample or whatever is not going to scratch or destroy the diamond. And notice that it's total reflection. So what does that mean? That means all of the light is bounced off the inside surface of that diamond. Diamond has a high refractive index, and so it's very reflective. And light bounces off on the inside of that diamond. It doesn't leave the diamond. So how does it interact with the sample? If it doesn't leave the diamond, how does it interact with the sample? It's that thing called the evanescent wave. And so it's... It's a field or wave that extends into a region where it cannot go. <laughs> so it extends a little bit. And it's, it's extending a little bit. And so if you might imagine, uh, uh, you know, it's like the surface of a trampoline vibrating. What if, if you had something on top that vibrated at that same frequency, it could take some of that energy of vibration. And so the infrared light is vibrating the surface of that diamond at all of the mid-infrared frequencies. And if you've got a sample on there, let's say the, it's got a CH stretch, that CH stretch can take some of the 3,000 wave number of vibrations out of that light. And so that's what the word attenuated means. So attenuated means reduced. So the attenuation of those different frequencies by the sample looks a lot like an infrared spectrum. And so the light's bouncing off the inside of that diamond, and some of those frequencies are attenuated. They've gone into the sample, and they're missing from the light. And so you do I and the I naught. You take the ratio, you get transmittance, take the minus log of that, you get absorbance. And so you've got the full spectrum. And so you, you, get, uh, you get a spectrum. Now, the one difficult thing with ATR and, and caused some trouble with it uh, originally was that it does not have this, this evanescent wave transmits into the sample. That's a function of frequency. So down here at 500 wave numbers, it goes about almost 1.4 microns into the sample. So I guess pretty far depth, 1.4 microns, 1,400 nanometers. But over here at 4,000 wave numbers, it's less than 0.2 microns. So it doesn't go very far into the sample in the CH stretch region, so those peaks are really tiny. But the like carbon chlorine peaks and other things are really tall because it's, you get a lot of path length. So this path length is, the, is wave number dependent for attenuated total reflectance. This evanescent wave doesn't penetrate very deep at the high frequencies. So what, fate, what problems could this have in court? 
this is say a peak at 1400 if you put it on that sloping baseline the peak maximum slides a little bit and it's 1390 And so you might have a problem if you say the peak for this, let's just make up an example, this drug has an absorbance at 1400. And you show evidence and the peak picker says it's 1390, they're like, wait a second. <laughs> you said, now you always want to put ranges on things, that's one thing. But also you say, well, we, we corrected it. And then they say you corrected it. You know, prove to me that there's a scientific basis for this correction, this ATR correction. So now ATR is accepted, but when it first went in to court, there was problems with it because if they corrected the data, then they had used an unproven correction that didn't have a legal pedigree. And if they didn't correct it, then all the peaks were different and they didn't quite match. They had a library that was using KBR pellets and they had samples that were using ATR and they didn't quite line up. They didn't look exactly the same. And so now forensic labs have gone through and recollected all of those drug samples and everything else with ATRs. And so now they have an ATR library, and you have an ATR sample, and it's, it's all working well. There are other spectroscopic methods, x-ray fluorescence, scanning electron microscopy, atomic absorption spectroscopy, most of those others using Beer's Law, so quantitative analysis, absorbances, uh, proportional to concentration. So let's look at some of the fluorescence ideas. X-ray fluorescence. An X-ray comes in. Most of the time, this knocks out the one S electron. That's the most easy to detect when the, the other electrons drop down. And so it's the level they're going to is how they're labeled. So these are all labeled as K uh, uh, emissions. So these electrons drop down and they emit x-rays and you have the K alpha 1 and 2 that come from the 2s and 2p orbitals down into the 1s. Then you have the K beta which comes from the 3 shell and then K gamma comes from the 4 shell. So you have all of these different, um, different x-ray emissions. These are fluorescent emissions. So x-ray light comes in, knocks out an electron and then all of these other electrons drop down. And so each individual element will give different wavelengths for these different x-rays. The reason they all have different wavelengths based on the elements is that every element has a different number of protons. So it's the protons that decide or determine the energies of these different orbitals. And so you can clearly tell the difference between, say, aluminum and silicon or boron and gallium. So every different number of protons is going to give you a different X-ray emission. So this is fantastic. And X-rays penetrate through most materials. So you can put this in, blast it with X-rays, and you get the atomic composition of the substance. So this will tell you that the percent elemental composition. You can also do this with uh, scanning electron microscopy. So we scan the electrons, and we have an image over here, a, a, a thing that's sensitive to electrons. And if we, like a television, raster across the surface and detect those backscattered electrons, we get an image. So on a really reflective piece, then we'll see a, a bright spot. And on an absorptive piece, we'll see a dim spot. And so if we raster the beam, the electron beam, and we detect, and we get an image of the surface. So that's electron microscopy. We're not using light, we're using electrons. Now some of those electrons will scatter electrons out from the inner shell of the electrons and it'll, the same thing that happened before, if an electron comes in instead of an x-ray and knocks this electron out, those other electrons can jump down and we get x-rays spitting out of our sample. So we can detect these x-rays and get an idea of what the atomic composition is of the, of the sample. And so the electron beam can knock out an electron, and then we can get these different characteristic x-rays. Here's an instrument that very few uh, chemists would have experience with because they're not really academic instruments. These were developed in private uh, corporations for the military for detecting chemical warfare agents. And so they make this little gizmo here that's 
about the size of, um, it's about that big. And it can be worn on the belt. It's bulky, but if you're in a war zone, there might be chemical weapons. You would like to have this little nose <laughs> hooked to your belt. It'll ring an alarm at really low concentrations of chemical agents so you have time to get your protective gear on. Okay, and it'll also be able to stop alarming when it's all clear. So this, how does this work? Well, you uh, want to ionize the substances, but you don't want to have to use high voltage power supply. You don't want to have to walk around with a power cord. And so they use a radioactive substance in here, nickel 63. And so that nickel 63 is spitting out high energy electrons or beta particles. And you can, for the airport, they use these in the airport, they take this little wipe and they wipe your luggage or your shoes and they stick it in this instrument and hot air comes through and desorbs any of the organic molecules on that wipe and it comes up here and gets into this radioactive zone where it gets ionized. And then here's the detector and there's a counter flow of gas. So it looks like a mass spectrometer, but there's not a vacuum in here. So that's what makes it different than MS. This is ion mobility, not mass spectrometry. It's ion mobility spectrometry, not really mass spectrometry. So it's not separating them based on their mass. It's separating on their ability to get through this, this flow of air. So air is flowing backwards through this thing, and the, the molecules are trying to make their way through this crowded dance floor and get to the detector. <laughs> now all these little rings are just ways to focus these charged particles on the detector. So if they're negatively charged, then these rings are going to be negative to keep them in the middle, and they're going to hit the collector eventually because the collector is really positive. If you detect positive ions, then the collector will be negative and these rings will be positive. And so here's explosives. Explosives tend to make negative ions. Uh, is that right? Or, yeah, the explosives are negative ions. And then they flow through this counterflow of air and hit the detector. Uh, narcotics typically form positive ions, and so you can use this to detect drugs. Now at the airport they have dual tube instruments. So positive ions go say to the right and the negative ions go to the left. And so they can detect narcotics and explosives in the same instrument. And so this is what a, a drift spectrum looks like. So here's the, the ion source, the molecules are coming through, here's the detector. And so you would get a big bump whenever those molecules hit the detector. What they do is they do several of these, and they make this what is called waterfall plot. And so the time units are called segments, and then these are different scans. It starts out, it's always detecting the carrier gas. The carrier gas has a little bit of like methylene chloride in it, so you get the spectrum, which is sort of a, a data validation tool. So you're always seeing the, the background gas, and you know it's working well, and then you introduce your sample, and that background gas is competing with your sample for those high energy electrons in the ionization. So when your sample comes in and it gets ionized, then you don't have any more ionized background gas. And so then the sample grows in and you, you measure this total amplitude. So this would be the plasmagram. This is what's an ionized gas, a plasma. This is the plasmagram for your sample. And so you have different criteria. You have the, which segment it appears in. So like this might be the signal for cocaine. And this might be the signal for heroin. And so you would say, wow, this has a high hit on heroin and a moderate hit on cocaine. Uh, we have one of these in forensic science. And occasionally we'll pull it out and we'll detect everybody's money. And so you rub that money and stick it in there and you'll see drugs on just about everybody's money. Yeah. It's just kind of see whose money is the dirtiest. You know? So you get sometimes a high hit on heroin, or a high hit on cocaine. And so, yeah, one, it was some convenience store south of here. A student was commuting. He was like, oh, this place is sketchy. Test my money. He said, they gave me all crisp number, you know, $1 bills and change. And so we tested those ones, and they were coated in drugs. <laughs> it's gotten so bad in terms of drug residue on money that you cannot be charged for having drug residue on your money. Used to, like if you're at the airport and you're traveling with a lot of cash and the dog smells cash, they have cash smelling dogs, they pull you aside and they test your money and if there's drug residue on your money, you've got a problem because they think you're a drug dealer. You know, 
and it was just money you got from the bank. And so that had become such an issue of innocent people being charged for, for drug trafficking or, or money laundering associated with drugs that uh, they, were, they were shown to be innocent because the evidence didn't support anything else except that there was drug residue on their money, that they took that out as a, as a criterion because everybody's money is covered in drugs. Uh, it's, it's, it's covered in drugs to the detection limit. Like, we can easily detect it. But um, don't go licking your drug. <laughs> it's not enough to be pharmacologically active, okay? But, but it's just enough detectable residue. It shows you how, how sensitive our instruments are. Plus, you'd be stupid to do that. You fail your drug test, and you don't even have any effect. You know, so, uh, it's like eating a bunch of poppy seed muffins. A friend of mine got his drug test failed uh, for opiates because he ate like four or five poppy seed muffins. Yeah, it's bad. So then uh, another thing that might not have been covered as well in, in instrumental, I'm not sure, but certain analytes for GC are, are problematic, especially acids, organic acids, because they're so polar. In fact, they hydrogen bond even because they have that, that proton on them. And they can bond to a normal phase stationary column. And so they will stick on that column for quite a while. And this really lengthens out your... It, in a practical sense, it lengthens your analysis because they elute so slowly. And sometimes that those acid groups are such that they raise the boiling point of the substance too high for GC. So you have to use LC. But let's say you wanted to use GC. You can put a molecule on that acid group, react it. It's called derivatization. And so these fairly large molecules will react with, with acids and HCl salts and they will neutralize those, those strongly polar hydrogen bonding amine groups and acid groups and put on these really volatile like methyl groups or a phenyl group and will actually lower the boiling point and cause them to elute faster. So you can take a drug that's going to be something that really is going to cause problems with your GC method and you can put in a reactant like this and derivatize it and then detect the derivative. Another thing that helps too, some of these have things like silicon and fluorine and silicon. Those are going to give, in mass spec, a different isotope pattern so you know that's the derivatized drug. So they're also going to be much easier to detect and it's going to pull them out of the noise in terms of other fragments and, and other kinds of analytes. And then here's a nice little guide I pulled from my analytical book. Uh, it's a general guide to column selection. There's just a wealth of information on this little chart. So we have normal phase and reverse phase. We have adsorption for permanent gases. So over here is molecular weight. So these top areas are the really lightest molecules, like the light permanent gases, you know, methane and butane and so on. Uh, then you have partition chromatography, which uses your normal partition, which is a polar stationary phase, or the uh, non-polar stationary phase, which is reversed. And then ion exchange, where you're just doing ion chromatography at that point. So light ions would be here. Then you get into the heavier molecules. So, you know, 100,000 uh, grams per mole, you know, average molecular weight. And you have exclusion or gel filtration or gel permeation uh, chromatography. So these would be liquid chromatography techniques. Up here at the very top, those would be gas chromatography techniques or liquid ion exchange techniques. And so then here's some other key terms we talked about today. We talked about polarized light microscopy, Raman, X-ray diffraction. Uh, look up a ductively coupled plasma. I'm sure you covered that in instrumental, but what do those terms mean? I ask you that in the homework. What is inductive? What is coupled? What is plasma? And why is that useful for metals and not organic substances? And so then that's, that's an overview of instruments you didn't cover in instrumental analysis <laughs> or some deeper topics on some of the instruments that you're familiar with.